Greetings and welcome to Ischemic Cerebral Vascular Disease. This is a talk intended for our clinical critical care fellows uh, as part of their academic half day. So what we're going to cover today are some of the fundamentals in uh, in the management of patients with acute strokes, uh, not focusing specifically on man the direct management of strokes uh, insofar as uh, the clinical exam or the, uh, the indications for uh, TPA, uh, which will be discussed in brief, um, but more focused on the critical care aspects of it uh, because the vast majority of times a critical care uh, professional will be brought in to see a patient who is either having a stroke or has recently been treated for a stroke or suffering some complications from a stroke. So by the end of the session, we'd like you guys to be able to understand some of the risks and distributions of, uh, of strokes in, in patients and as well as the common clinical findings for both the carotid and the basilar uh, thromboses. Um, we'll go over the common critical care complications of strokes that you may be, uh, you, you may be faced with and then discuss some of the indications and contraindications for the uh, currently used treatments for, uh, for stroke. And then final, uh, finally uh, conclude with a uh, discussion of prognostication. So we'll, starting from the top, we'll go over the vascular distribution and symptomatology. Just uh, serve mostly as a refresher for you on, on uh, how people with strokes will present. Uh, how the diagnosis is made, followed by the uh, the treatment options that are available for the uh, for the vast majority of patients, uh, followed by the complications and the prognosis. So to start off with, uh, we should talk about the vascular distribution. Okay, so starting on the left, you can see the uh, arterial supply for the brain, both the anterior and the posterior. Uh, circulation. Starting down at the bottom is the vertebral arteries which uh, will eventually both on both sides will form up to form the basilar artery. The vertebral artery also splits and goes down to form the anterior spinal artery and there's also a branch uh, off just off the at the base of the vertebral artery for the uh, pica or the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. The uh, basilar artery feeds the vast majority of the of the brain stem, uh, so obviously an extremely important uh, artery uh, for life, and then splits off uh, and forms the posterior cerebral arteries on both sides. Now, concurrent with that, coming up on the coming up and feeding the anterior distribution of the of the brain is the uh, carotid artery. Carotid artery. <laughs> joins off and uh, forms off and almost immediately becomes the middle cerebral artery, but by connections with the posterior communicating arteries on both sides, forms a circle of Willis. And then the anterior cerebral artery forms off, comes off of the carotid circle of Willis middle cerebral artery complex uh, to feed the very front portion of the brain. The anterior communicating artery sits between the two an uh, anterior cerebral arteries to, um, uh, to form the connection that makes the circle of Willis uh, a circle. Uh, for people, for, for uh, some people, there's actually a congenital defect where they don't actually have that connection. And so obviously they lack the ability to form, uh, su uh, supply uh, ischemic areas by backfilling from the, across the, other, the opposite side of the, uh, uh, of the uh, cerebral circulation. Now, as far as the distribution of each of these arteries, what uh, what areas of the brain they, they feed, uh, the middle diagram shows a very stylized um, image of what, uh, what what you should know. We're not going to go into a lot of detail about all of the uh, the, the various uh, um, uh, structures that are are fed, and you should just know these in general terms. So uh, essentially starting with the anterior cerebral artery, as you can see, forms the, f the, the front portion of the brain and actually comes up and around the, uh, the frontal lobe and feeds the, uh, feeds the lip of the outside of the frontal lobe. And then most of the interior half of the, uh, of the, end of the, um, of the frontal lobe. As you can see at the top, it feeds the inside, uh, inside there and 
for the most part, uh, if you remember your homunculus, this is the portion of the of the motor strip on this that would f uh, be f uh, mostly directly controlled by the uh, the lower extremities and the f and the legs. The posterior cer cerebral artery feeds the back portion of the brain, so this feeds the occipital lobe and a portion of the temporal lobe uh, for the most part, as well as through a number of different perforator vessels. will also feed some of the deeper structures such as the uh, thalamus, the basal ganglia, and, uh, and deeper portions thereof. Uh, and then, so uh, injuries to the posterior cerebral artery will t take out mostly in the back portion. The vertebral artery and the basilar system feed the rest of the, the, of the posterior bra uh, brain, including the brain stem, the cerebellum. Uh, and so that's a completely different te territory. And then the, the middle cerebral artery uh, forms a, the larger portion of the distribution of the cortex, uh, including most of the uh, parietal uh, lobes on both sides and, and a good chunk of the temporal lobes. So when it comes to ischemic strokes, this is an, this, losing this artery can represent a very significant problem. Uh, for the patient as it involves a, a huge chunk of territory that can get lost in a very short period of time. Finally, the, the diagram on the far right uh, is a, a, a schematic of all of the individual cranial nerves and serves as a reminder that the brainstem uh, is uh, densely packed with uh, cranial nerves and then a loss of blood supply to the uh, to the um, to the vertebral basilar system can cause a significant amount of problems in a short amount of time because a small stroke can affect a fairly large number of very important structures. And also these are the structures that form a lot of the foundations of our clinical exam. Well, the vast majority of patients who present with stroke-like symptoms present with some form of a carotid distribution uh, type stroke. These, this is the type of strokes that most people are familiar with and are usually not missed. Uh, somebody who has a, a, a stroke involving the uh, carotid distribution will present with some form of hemiparesis, some loss of uh, hemisensory uh, sensation on one side. They may become aphasic. Uh, if the ophthalmic artery is involved, they may have uh, uh, visual losses that are not related to um, cortical loss from the posterior cerebral artery. Uh, they may also have neglect, or if it does involve the posterior cerebral territory, then they may develop a homonymous hemianopsia. These are usually not that hard to, uh, to identify, um, and the vast majority of times when patients have a carotid distribution stroke, they're usually picked up very quickly in the emergency department or by the patient's family. The vertebral basilar distribution, though, can be a lot more complex, and this is, if there's ever a time when I've seen somebody miss a stroke or delay the diagnosis in a stroke, it's been when the vertebral basilar distribution has been uh, responsible for, this, for the symptoms. These people will still present with some form of, of uh, motor dysfunction, but it, depending on where the, where the crossover has occurred and where the, where the stroke ischemia is, the crossover uh, the the the, district, the 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 motor defect may be um, uh, on the contralateral or on the ipsilateral side. Similarly, with sensory loss, it can be cross or bilateral, and it and it's not it's not always very clear. If the cerebellum gets taken out, sometimes the patients will actually present with just a gait uh, ataxia. They may not actually be very it may not be very obvious uh, what is going on. They sometimes are even accused of being drunk or Having having some other problem that's that's uh, that's causing them to stumble about. Um, while they may stumble and tend to stumble to one side, you can't necessarily rely on that as a uh, uh, as a clear indication that the stroke a stroke is a problem. If the distribution includes portions of the uh, posterior cerebral artery, because as you can as you've seen, the vertebral and basilar system attach directly to the posterior cerebral artery they can have a homomnous uh, hemianopsia. But once you get down into the brainstem territory, things get really unclear, and they may present with um, very bizarre type or unusual presentation that you may that people may not uh, initially pick up on. They may develop just dysarthrias, they may become vert, vertigo, vert, they may have vertigo, 
Uh, they may have just ver uh, dysphagia or dys dysplopia. But one of the number one things that you need to watch out for when somebody presents with a decreased level of consciousness is you have to ask yourself the question, is this a person who has a vertebral uh, or, a, or a basilar stroke as the cause of their decreased level of consciousness? You can't, um, you can't always rely on it, but, but the vast majority of patients that I've seen who have a, some form of vertebral basilar uh, ischemia usually have some f symptoms that precede their decreased level of consciousness. And I think part of the reason is that is because the, um, the reticular activating center is tend to be a lot more um, uh, distal in the brain stem and so are a lot more protected from the, from the ischemia and it takes some time for those to develop. But they'll present with some sort of a gait ataxia or they'll have some motor distribution problems or they'll just have, you know, they'll be violently ill from vertigo and throwing up, but then they have some bizarre eye signs or something that's just, you know, not quite right about them, that that's your only clue that they're having, a, that they have a, uh, that they're having a vertebral basilar stroke. Unfortunately, the problem with this, this, this type of a stroke is that if you delay in the diagnosis, you lose an opportunity to treat and the outcomes are horrible for this patient population. So you have to maintain a high level of index, a high index of suspicion, especially when patients present with bizarre neurological symptoms, including a decreased level of consciousness. Okay, so I've warned you about all of these things. So how would how would we generally approach the diagnosis of of a stroke in this uh, in this patient population? Well, most of the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis and because the vast majority of patients who present with stroke symptoms have a carotid distribution type stroke, they tend to have a fairly quickly picked up uh, and they're quickly identified even pre-hospital as stroke. And in, in most uh, centers, there's a very aggressive uh, stroke center and stroke program that will ha uh, uh, creates an environment where uh, pre-hospital personnel have a very low threshold to call somebody a, a, a possible stroke to really accelerate their transfer to some form of tertiary care or at the very least to a place where there's a CT scanner. The gold standard for the diagnosis of stroke still is the CT scan in the initial phase of the of the diagnose, diagnostic workup because not because the stroke is could necessarily be seen on a CT scan. And as you can see on this scan on the far uh, left hand, the patient has had a stroke, but the CT scan looks remarkably unremarkable. And that's really in the initial phase is the key bit of information that they need to know. What the, uh, in, in an acute stroke program, the f initial CT is essentially just to rule out any other cause for, a, for their uh, neurological symptoms, such as a, an intracerebral bleed. Once, uh, it, so it's not unexpected that a patient will present with stroke-like symptoms. The clinical diagnosis will be made. The CT scan will be done to exclude any other cause, and then the patient will be immediately uh, placed on the path towards thrombolysis or some form of intervascular uh, interventions. So, so don't don't be surprised if the initial CT scan is normal. It takes several hours for for the uh, CT scan to start to develop the changes that we expect to see. And you can see in the middle picture there is a patient who's had a stroke that's now well evolved, and you can see that there's a lot of darkness on the uh, uh, on the right hand side in the right MCA territory. And this is also associated with in this case with a significant amount of cerebral edema. And there's some midline shift that's already starting to occur in this uh, with this patient. So this patient's already in a lot of trouble. But this this uh, the CT scan has taken at least a day for for it to evolve into this uh, into this picture. Don't be surprised if the initial CT scan you see is is completely negative. Now, depending on which center you're working in you may have the ability to perform a CT angiogram. And that's becoming, at least in our site, is becoming a much more common test to be used to augment the diagnosis of stroke. 
So a patient will present um, at the at a at a quaternary stroke center. The first step will be to get an emergent CT scan, and then as long as that's read initially as negative by the stroke uh, stroke service, they may the patient may quickly be then moved back to the CT scanner for a CTA to actually document the distribution of the of the stroke to actually visualize the occlusion. So, and in, especially in the cases of vertebral basilar distribution, the CTA can be the, the make or break it diagnosis because as you're well aware, the CT of the posterior circulation such as the brain stem is not the best test in the world for that uh, for that type of uh, for that for that area of the brain and a vertebral basilar infarct by the time you see the ischemia developing well the patient's well in into their infarction it's too late for any interventions so a CTA can actually be life-saving for those patients and I think increasingly the the push is to do the emergency T demonstrate that there's no bleed, then do the CTA immediately afterwards to show that there's what the distribution is, and then proceed on to, to getting the uh, to, to, to more definitive treatment. So in, in the cases where you're presented with a possible stroke, I would strongly encourage you to consider getting a CTA almost immediately after the CT scan. Because as I said, your initial scan will probably be negative, uh, especially if it's an acute stroke. And you're only you're only looking to exclude things. The CTA will actually help you make the diagnosis for cert with certainty. Other ways of making the diagnosis of stroke uh, include using uh, diffusion weighted MRI. Now, diffusion weighted MRI is an image you can see on the f on the right hand side. is uh, is an interesting technique, relatively new, in MRI, uh, whereby the uh, basically uh, the, pro the, water, the protons in a water molecules are being tagged individually, or not individually necessarily, but in smaller, uh, smaller groups, and over a period of time, repeated uh, MR is being used to pick up the movement of those molecule of those uh, protons uh, throughout the brain tissue. So, if there's an area of brain that's receiving normal blood flow then any protons from water that's in that blood is quickly gone because it's moved on to other areas of the body. But if there's an area where there's, uh, and it's so sorry, and similarly with the, uh, with the cerebral tissue, there's a free, if there's blood flow, there's a free exchange of, of water and protons. So you'll see that water moving around uh, fairly freely. But in an area where there's ischemia, where there's a lack of blood flow, those protons are kind of stuck there and they don't really have anywhere to go and so they tend to light up and and uh, uh, resonate much more more um, uh, much more uh, uh, higher intensity on the scanner and as you can see on this side here a uh, diffusion weighted MRI uh, demonstrates ele uh, increasing uh, uh, brightness in areas of restricted uh, diffusion now in the acute phase of a stroke an MRI is not your test of choice, um, but will frequently be done uh, subsequent to the diagnosis after the intervention to help give a, a sense to the stroke service of the amount of territory that was at risk or the uh, or the amount of potential damage that uh, that the patient's facing to help with prognostication. Uh, so it's not uncommon to see patients with acute strokes going for MRIs now almost uh, not only to de demonstrate the uh, the inflammatory changes that can be seen on an MRI but also to see what what uh, what areas of ischemia are present on diffusion weighted imaging that will be seen sooner than what you would exp what you'll see on a CT scan that would take at least 24 hours to evolve into the picture that you see in the middle Okay, so let's uh, jump right into treatment for uh, stroke, uh, including the usual as well as some of the uh, more uh, up-and-coming treatment options available. So now, in the early phases of the diagnosis of stroke, one of the uh, fundamental uh, management strategies should be towards managing the blood pressure. 
Um, there's two reasons for that. Number one, the um, uh, hypertension is a frequent confounder in patients as hypertension is a risk factor for the development of atherosclerosis. And also, the um, uh, inclusion-exclusion criteria for thrombolysis uh, has or relies on, on certain blood pressure parameters. Now, managing the blood pressure in somebody with a stroke can be a bit of a challenge. If they've been chronically hypertensive, uh, you don't want to drop their blood pressure too low because there's areas of the brain that are now subject to altered autoregulation. And as well, there may be a penumbra of, of uh, peri-ischemic territory that if you drop the blood pressure too low, it could actually cause it to uh, join the infarction family and, uh, uh, and die as well. And so you're trying to preserve that. And then thirdly, the blood pressure will often go up auto, on, on its own accord as the brain is attempting to maximize its perfusion. So in general, the principle we use for managing blood pressure for ischemic strokes is to maintain is to allow the blood pressure to go to whatever number it wishes to go to so long as that number isn't over 220 if the patient uh, as a systolic if the patient is not being given thrombolysis if the patient is getting thrombolysis or has received thrombolysis then you want to maintain a blood pressure less than 180 uh, to minimize their or reduce their risk of a, of a hemorrhagic transformation the medications of choice for managing the blood pressure uh, are uh, labetalol, hydralazine are usually our first line choices, followed by nitroglycerin and then occasionally nitroprusside when the when the blood pressure is really refractory. Uh, if the patient, obviously, the next day as the dust is settling, if the patient's on antihypertensives, it's often a good idea to restart antihypertensives to keep their baseline uh, blood pressure control. And, uh, and continue to augment and maintain their, manage their blood pressure uh, with IV PRNs as, as necessary to keep their blood pressure below, uh, below 180 uh, if they've been thrombolyzed. Now in the case of, of hemorrhage or hemorrhagic stroke, this rule does not apply. You would actually be very aggressive about managing their blood pressure and getting it down to uh, much lower levels. But today we're only talking about ischemic strokes, so the focus is on Allowing the, is more on allowing the blood pressure to do as is, but uh, but only under certain circumstances start to uh, to more aggressively control it. Um, now the mainstay of therapy for patients with ischemic strokes, if they present inside the window of two to four and a half hours, depending on the uh, symptomatology, uh, is to administer uh, thrombolysis um, if their NIH score is, is uh, sufficient. So they have to have lost major territory of um, uh, of brain loss, dysfunction, loss of use of one side, blindness, aphasia. Like major territory has to be lost. They can't just have a little tingling in their hands and and they get thrombolysed for that. Um, it has to be a large territory. It is important that you have the uh, exclusion ex inclusion criteria in your head, especially as uh, as you approach a, a certain quiz coming up in the near future for you. So the indications are for stroke are, are for thrombolysis in acute stroke is acute ischemic stroke within the defined onset of uh, time. Uh, again, the usual limit is uh, three hours. Uh, but under certain circumstances, a stroke neurologist may extend that out to four and a half hours, uh, particularly if it involves the vertebral basilar area. Um, as you increase the age or increase the time that you before you start thrombolysis, the risk of hemorrhagic transformation goes up. So beyond three hours, the risk of hemorrhagic transformation becomes much more significant and the risk-benefit ratio becomes uh, much less favorable. So it's not that thrombolysis wouldn't work uh, out uh, beyond three hours. It's just that the risks are now becoming um, higher and become intolerable as you get beyond four and a half hours. The neurological defect has to be measurable and it has to be measured using the NIH stroke scale, which is usually done by the stroke neurology team um, or by one of the bedside nurses in the emergency department.
you have to have a CT scan which demonstrates no evidence of any hemorrhage whatsoever so even a little blush of blood is enough to uh, to, to call it off you can't uh, even in the rare cases where you have a stroke followed by a small hemorrhagic transformation uh, early on there's no uh, you cannot thrombolize those people and then they obviously have to be over 18 years of age the contraindications for thrombolysis uh, you have to know well in your head uh, is so the is the uh, presence of a stroke MI or head injury within the last three months um, any major surgery within the last 14 days and it's often a good idea to contact the surgeon and find out whether they have any specific concerns even if they even if it wasn't necessarily major surgery um, if there was any prior intracerebral hemorrhage in the past they're at a much higher risk for hemorrhagic transformation and they shouldn't be uh, thrombolyzed uh, if their blood pressure is too high on several checks, so the systemic systolic blood pressure over 185 or diastolic over 110 is a contraindication to thrombolysis. It's a bit of a relative contraindication and certainly if you're aggressive about your blood pressure control in that population, get it down, um, you can often get them their pressure controlled well enough that they can actually become a candidate. So it's important that you're aggressive up front with those. Um, you should, as part of the investigations, make sure that the stroke symptoms are not resolving. If they've got a TIA, then obviously you wouldn't want to give uh, t uh, uh, TPN for that or TPA for that. Um, and you also want to ensure that you exclude hypoglycemia, which should be part of the workup that occurred in the emergency department. Other contraindications include uh, a GI or, or a GU bleed within the last 21 days or any non-compressible or, or arterial puncture, so not including the femoral or the, uh, uh, or the wrist. Uh, and then if there's any signs of an ongoing coagulopathy prior to administration of TPA such that the uh, INR is elevated or if the uh, PTT is elevated or if there's significant uh, thrombo, uh, thromb uh, thrombocytopenia, then those are relative contraindications to uh, thrombolysis. So what happens though in certain circumstances is that especially when the uh, vertebral basilar system is involved um, it is now becoming increasingly the standard of care to proceed from TPA directly to uh, interventional radiology if you're in a in a uh, one of those designated stroke centers. So at our site uh, when a patient presents with a stroke, uh, they'll be thrombolyzed if it's the carotid artery territory, but if it's a vertebral basilar, then the standard has become to um, thrombolyze, to initiate uh, anticoagulant, uh, to, to initiate thrombolysis, and then to follow that up with uh, emergent uh, interventional radiology to, uh, to try and extract the, uh, the uh, vertebral uh, or basilar uh, clot. Uh, if it's not been dealt with by the uh, by the TPA alone, uh, the 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 rationale behind this is the brainstem is relatively more hardy, can tolerate ischemia for a longer period of time, um, but any damage in that area can be devastating. So, a more aggressive intervention early on may benefit these patients. As well, uh, under certain other certain circumstances, interventional radiology may be selected as an option if the patient's outside the window for thrombolysis involving the carotid artery territory, but the amount of territory that's involved is uh, pretty significant. So a very large MCA territory stroke, the, uh, depending on the patient's characteristics and the decisions of the stroke neurologist, they may take the patient directly to interventional radiology for uh, clot extraction uh, or mechanical break breakup. So as a critical care physician, you may get the phone call that so-and-so is going, has had a ma massive stroke, is going for immediate uh, IR and uh, will have their airway secured because you obviously don't want uh, you know, confused dysarthric hemiparetic patients flashing around on an interventional radiology bed while uh, somebody's got you know, catheters stuck up in their brain trying to administer clot busting medications and suck out small clots. So often the airway gets secured and they're sedated and they'll require some sort of a uh, post, post procedure ICU level care to, uh, for at least for recovery. As the, um, so the, as that's the initial management and as you proceed in as the patient may, 
become a become a ICU patient either by virtue of some procedure that was performed or some complication that's occurred uh, including a decreased level of consciousness and a failure to protect their airway requiring capture of their airway um, or an aspiration event causing acute respiratory failure uh, also requiring them to be intubated so you may become involved in their care at that point in time uh, and your management of those patients would proceed as, as you would along any other pathway for the management of somebody with an acute, uh, an acute uh, pneumonitis or pneumonia, um, or if in the case of decreased level of consciousness, you would uh, approach anybody with their airway management. Um, it's important that you don't, otherwise, you, you just like with head injuries, you want to avoid hypoxia, you want to prevent hypotension, and in, in this case, relative hypotension, um, as you're securing the airway and then subsequently in your management and also in your um, uh, ch choice of uh, medication for um, uh, sedation and analgesia. The you may subsequently, uh, as your uh, your other other routine management of your uh, of the critically ill uh, stroke patient, should also ensure that you focus on both their temperature control and their glucose control. Hypoglycemia is obviously an extremely bad thing, but it, likewise, hyperglycemia can be also very uh, can cause a significant amount of secondary injury uh, in the stroke patient. So. It's important that you maintain a tight glucose control, and uh, but not so tight that you can actually induce hypoglycemia. Temperature control is important as well, just like as in uh, post cardiac arrest hypo uh, hypothermia. Um, although different in this case, in that we your goal is to try and keep the goal uh, temperature. Uh, at, at around 36 degrees, uh, and not let it, uh, not let the patient become febrile. So it's it's critical that you're you keep a close eye on the temperature and and uh, be very defensive against uh, the development of any fevers, um, whether they be from infectious causes or from non-infectious causes. So that's the initial treatment um, and some of the scenarios where in which critical care might be uh, involved uh, early on. As a uh, stroke evolves, though, there are a number of different complications that, uh, that you should watch out for. Uh, even if uh, the patient isn't under your direct care, it may be a complication, may be a reason why you're getting a phone call. The most obvious uh, complication that we'll see in stroke patients uh, is the risk of aspiration. This may happen initially uh, as they have the sudden event, they may have an aspiration event concurrent with that. Um, and again, as, as I've said, you, your management for this would follow along with the usual man, management of a, of a pneumonitis or early aspiration pneumonia in a non-hospitalized patient. Uh, protecting them against hypoxia, of course, being the one of the fundamental uh, key uh, issues that you need to watch for in addition to managing their airway. You may see aspiration uh, af later on in the course of the patient's uh, stroke care uh, as they, in many cases, have lost some of their, um, uh, th they may become dysphasic, they may have an inability to manage their oral secretions, they may uh, they may also, as most people, make have small uh, aspiration events, and because of their uh, uh, neurological injury, uh, now are unable to manage their secretions, cough effectively, uh, or uh, have lost uh, appropriate mucosal defenses and are at risk for developing uh, pneumonia. This patient population present later on, you would treat as a hospital-acquired pneumonia uh, with much uh, more aggressive antibiotics, uh, including uh, coverage against uh, multidrug resistant gram-negative bacilli, um, and also possibly by having full frank discussions with patient and family regarding outcomes and expectations. But we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Suffice it to say, aspiration, a common reason why patients with strokes end up in critical care uh, environments. Uh, seizures are a, pos are a possible risk. Uh, they are not as common as, uh, thankfully, as you would expect to see, considering the severity of the neurological injuries and the frequency with which patients present with, uh, with strokes. 
Um, but there is the occasion when somebody may actually present with the opposite problem, where they present with seizure and a Todd's paralysis, and they are actually thought to have had a stroke, and the seizure aspect was missed either because it was unwitnessed, um, uh, or, or or was unrecognized by either pre-hospital or emergency room uh, physicians. So um, the patient who has a missed uh, seizure is certainly at risk for having subsequent seizures, and so you have to maintain an early index of suspicion for for seizure development. Uh, and you would manage it just like you would manage anybody else with uh, uh, first line uh, benzodiazepine therapy, followed by antiepileptic uh, drugs uh, such as Dilantin or Keppra, um, and then uh, more aggressive uh, uh, sedation with uh, either ketamine or, or uh, propofol. Uh, if the seizures persist. Uh, strokes themselves are, are a risk factor for the development of seizures but are not very frequently seen um, in the post-stroke population. Uh, so, but be aware of the potential for patients who have had seizures that may have been missed for them actually having a stroke-like symptomatology that is in fact a uh, Todd's paralysis. Anytime you've had an injury to the brain, there's the risk of developing cerebral edema. C cerebral edema is not only uh, injurious because of uh, direct injury to the um, tissue that is swelling uh, itself, but also causes uh, surrounding injury and also co compromise uh, capillary perfusion compounding injury in otherwise previously uninjured uh, tissue. Ischemia itself can result in the transcriptional upregulation of uh, many different uh, mediators and, is, and transport proteins which can have um, an effect on the ability to manage uh, uh, fluid shifts as well as uh, can facilitate osmosis. Now there are uh, th three sequences of types of injury that are, that are uh, caused by edema. Uh, cytotoxic edema starts usually starts first, and this is a result of uh, ischemia inducing uh, depleting sodium from the extracellular environment um, that then leads on to ionic uh, uh, edema where Uh, intracellular, sorry, transmembrane uh, channels uh, become translocated and cause uh, change the flux of uh, sodium from the intracellular to the extracellular space. Both of these lead to significant uh, cellular swelling and can cause the uh, direct death of the uh, either the neurons or the glial cells uh, involved. And then the resulting death and release of toxic mediators can contribute to the development of vasogenic edema, where the, uh, as, which is, in a sense, a um, uh, inflammatory uh, reaction to the injury. Now, cerebral edema will occur in all of the strokes. It's an injury. It's a reaction to the injury. There's, there's nothing that can be done about it. However, under certain circumstances, especially when a large territory of the middle cerebral artery is involved, uh, patients can develop what's called uh, uh, a malignant MCA syndrome. This is a, a case where a large territory of, of brain tissue swells and causes shift, uh, as you've seen in the CT scans uh, earlier in this presentation. Uh, and this shift ca causes injury to uh, both uh, adjacent and also contralateral uh, tissue. The, the patient will have already presented with the findings of an NMCA territory infarction, including hemiparesis, neglect, visual def uh, gaze defects, um, aphasia, and such. However, when they develop the malignant MCA syndrome, they develop cerebral edema to the point where they actually have a decreasing level of consciousness um, because of the result of uh, injury 
to the ascending reticular activating system and projections from the thalamus and hypothalamus across to the uh, diffuse cortical territories. So as the level of consciousness goes down, uh, or so rather a stroke it's in of itself won't cause a decreased level of consciousness, but the cerebral edema and a malignant MCA syndrome the, uh, can cause a decreasing level of consciousness, and that's uh, obviously something that uh, uh, is a uh, critical care emergency. Now obviously in the case of an, a malignant MCA syndrome you want to rule out confounders such as hypercarbia, sedation, seizures, um, but you should have a low threshold in these circumstances to repeat imaging to uh, verify whether or not there is ongoing edema and shift. The risk factors for developing um, uh, developing a malignant MCA syndrome include having a higher N NIHS stroke score, which would not be surprising because a higher score means a, a larger area of territory that uh, affected. Uh, patients with persisting hypertension because they're at higher risk for developing vasogenic edema, um, previous decreased level of consciousness, or involvement of uh, multiple vascular territories, so not just MCA but also uh, ACA or, or posterior circulation gets involved. Um, and then finally, if they have heart failure, because it has the effects, the effects it may have on sodium um, uh, sodium levels present uh, at baseline. The management for malignant MCA syndrome is to uh, is to be aggressive with osmotic therapy to try to. Uh, both reduce the amount of uh, swelling, but also to uh, uh, enhance uh, viscosity in order to permit blood flow at a lower uh, 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 at a lower flow rate. Um, as a as a baseline treatment, um, but for but uh, oftentimes the patient is uh, has to be considered early for decision about whether or not they're a candidate for decompression. Now decompression uh, will is generally offered for patients who have a non-dominant hemisphere uh, stroke. So dominant hemispheres, the for all right-handed people, is the left M, left uh, left hemisphere. So the if they have a left MCA territory stroke, they develop an MCA syndrome, and they are developing significant shift. The outcome for this patient population is horrible, and as a general rule, it's not accepted uh, to offer um, uh, decompression uh, to try to relieve the pressure because, in a sense, all you're doing is saving them to a life of, uh, of significant disability. However, there will always be the occasional case where, especially if somebody's younger or they didn't seem as badly affected, they may be offered uh, a decompression if it's, even if it's dumb hemisphere. When it's non-dominant hemisphere, decompression is now an option, and it's often not a bad idea to actually get the neurosurgeons involved early in the patient's case before they develop uh, significant cerebral edema, so that you have them on board if they get into a lot of trouble, especially late at night, uh, and if there's the chance that there's a different surgeon on. Neurosurgeons have their own attitudes and opinions on decompression, and you may find that not everybody agrees with the indications, um, but considering the, the, the alternative, in if somebody develops a malignant MCA syndrome and you can't decompress them or, or if a neurosurgeon refuses to decompress them, the risk of death is extremely high in that population, even with uh, osmotic therapy. Hemorrhagic transformation is one of the more feared consequences of uh, thrombolysis. This is one of the reasons why we don't offer TPA beyond three hours as a general rule because the risk of hemorrhagic transformation increases significantly beyond that, that window. However, you also have to recall, re remember that patients who have had large territory infarctions are at risk for having hemorrhagic transformation up to three to five days out of their injury. Uh, from their initial stroke, as the uh, area of infarction starts to uh, liquefy, it leaves blood vessels uh, flapping in the breeze and at risk for, uh, for, for bleeding. TPA itself actually can cause, it can independently increase the risk of uh, 
bleeding because of the damage that it does to the blood-brain barrier uh, of its own accord. And then also there's, because you hopefully have got some reperfusion, there's always the risk of uh, reperfusion injury causing damage to the blood-brain barrier, which would then also increase its risk of, uh, of a hemorrhagic transformation. Any patient who presents with a, uh, with a stroke who has a decreased level of consciousness um, sudden, that, is, that occurs very suddenly, uh, you have to consider the possibility that they've had a, a, a bleed and they need an emergency CT scan. Uh, a, a malignant MCA syndrome tends to present with a decreasing level of consciousness over time, whereas a bleed obviously causes a sudden change, a sudden worsening in their condition, sudden loss of consciousness um, as one of the hallmarks or, by, or, by, or a resumption of previously recovered territory. So if they had a, a uh, an MCA stroke and had been thrombolyzed, regained some function, and then suddenly lost it again, you need to repeat the scan to make sure that they haven't had a bleed into their brain. Obviously, bleeding itself causes problems with increased ICP, uh, and also because of the uh, injurious nature of blood in the, in the, um, uh, in the cere cerebrum, can cause uh, cerebral edema of its own accord, which further compounds any underlying cerebral edema that's already going on. In these circumstances, the patient who presents with a bleed after thrombolysis is not a candidate for uh, for evacuation. Um, after they're outside the after the 24 hours, if they've had a bleed and they're at uh, and, and it's in a location that's uh, accessible, one can consider having neurosurgery involved to consider de uh, evacuation of the clot. However, again, this type of uh, transformation is often a prelude to discussions on goals of care. Now, lastly, I just want to talk about prognostication as uh, this is a bit of a moving target in critical care and critical care, um, uh, neurocritical care rather. When I started out, there was a rule of thumb that anybody who had a stroke who got intubated died um, over the years it's become increasingly obvious that there really is no clear evidence for prognostication um, and oftentimes there's a serious problem in, in published uh, literature on based on survivor bias um, and a probably just out and out ageism I mean why should we be aggressive with the 80 year old um, is often the uh, is often the mantra why bother I mean they're they've old they've lived a good life now they've had a big stroke so why should we bother being aggressive and offering critical care to that population well I mean that used to be the way it is and, and I honestly I, I don't know what the right answer is and so because there isn't very clear evidence I think we should be uh, mindful of patients um, well their advanced wishes um, what they would have wanted uh, as best known by their families, a trial of therapy is never inappropriate. And if they had if they had a good quality of life prior to this, and they had recovery of of you know of function with aggressive treatment, um, and had an expectation of returning to some reasonable level of existence that they found acceptable, I, I, I fail to see why we wouldn't try to at least offer them that. So trials of therapy, open conversations with families are, I think, probably um, important, but also be very mindful of your colleagues and remind them that, you know, a lot of times we've had outcomes that are skewed because of our past biases. I mean, if you have a study where you don't offer critical care to 80-year-olds who've had a non-dominant hemispheric stroke, well, then guess what? You're going to show that people who are over 80 don't do well if they've had a stroke because you've obviously limited them what the care they can have. I think that personally that there's a difference in outcomes uh, when patients have a uh, and a complication or an event early in their uh, in their stroke as opposed to later in their stroke so I would tend to be very aggressive when patients are early in their care, care because we don't know what their ultimate out disposition is going to be like what their ultimate outcomes are going to be and I don't see why we shouldn't try and give them the best possible opportunity to survive because we can always stop if it becomes clear that the outcome is going to be going to be uh, terrible. Um, so I would be mindful. I would be uh, 
much more aggressive with that population. However, if a patient's been in the hospital for, you know, six weeks and they've had a stroke and they or had the stroke six weeks ago and they have had a fixed defect and nothing's really changed and they're bed bound and the you know their clinical their 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 actual function is very poor. Well, I don't think that it would be reasonable for us to offer critical care in that environment because those patients are not what we're doing is we're we're not going to make them better than the way they were before the event that led them to come critically ill six weeks into their stroke. And so I think at that point in time, having frank discussions with families is important to outline what ICU is, what we can offer, how we impact on the outcome, and how this may not necessarily offer the patient the best possible possibility of, uh, uh, of uh, having a quality of life that would be uh, worthwhile. And, and having those discussions with the families, uh, although difficult, um, often if cast in the light of, you know, this has been going on for six weeks and now they have pneumonia, the pneumonia is a consequence of the stroke. This will, even with treatment, will eventually recur and they will eventually succumb to this. You know, this is probably, this is going to happen eventually. You should probably uh, prepare yourself for, for this eventuality. In the in the past, I mean, they used to. We actually used to, people used to call pneumonia the old man's friend because it was the thing that came and took the patient who was now old and decrepit and hadn't uh, had didn't have a good quality of life. And it's the pneumonia that takes them when they're living in the nursing home. So I, I think that if the patient presents long into their stroke with a pneumonia, it's probably time to accept it there's inevitability. So that's about all I have to, uh, to discuss today. Um, obviously questions on a YouTube video are, are irrelevant, but uh, if you have any comments or questions, please um, feel free to put them in the uh, uh, comments section of the, uh, of the video and uh, I'll answer them as best I can. Thank you very much for listening and uh, talk to you later.